So uh, I'm going to start off by um, talking about uh, the Institute for Public Policy Research. What are we? We're a think tank. So what is that? A think tank is an organisation that tries to come up with policy proposals to be adopted either by the present government or by a future government through the form of political parties taking on the recommendations. IPPR was founded about 30 years ago. Uh, we've got offices in London, in Manchester, Newcastle and in Edinburgh. And Mariana is one of our trustees. Um, our goal is to try and create a more progressive society and we do that by coming up with fresh ideas across all different areas of life. So that ranges from the economy through to public services, uh, through to transport, the uh, environment, climate and so on. So we cover pretty much all different areas of public policy. A couple of years ago, in 2016, in the wake of the referendum results on Britain's decision to leave the European Union, um, we established something called the Commission on Economic Justice. So the observation was that we needed a fundamental rethink of our economic model. And as the name suggests, economic justice, um, the belief that it wasn't working fairly um, to begin with. So I set about putting together an interesting crowd of people to form this commission. So if you look on the screen there, what you'll see is that you've got people from all different walks of life. So you've got people representing um, some of the world's most successful businesses. You've got trade unionists, you've got economists, uh, community activists, organisers, and even the Archbishop of Canterbury, um, who is one of the commissioners. And the purpose was really to do a fundamental rethink uh, of the UK economy, and I'm going to talk through some of the findings of our report. Indeed, in the two years that the Commission ran for, between 2016 and 2018, uh, we published 18 discussion papers covering all sorts of different topics from the future digital economy to industrial strategy, finance, corporate governance reform, automation, uh, wealth inequality, uh, macroeconomics, land reform, all sorts of different topics. So we set ourselves a rather big scope of how do you fix the entire UK economy um, and decided to throw ourselves into it over that two year period. There are then two big reports, so Time for Change, which was the interim report of the Commission, that really argued that we needed a new vision for the British economy and what that would look like. And then Prosperity and Justice, that was the final report published in September. So if any of you were watching the news in September and you remember hearing the Archbishop of Canterbury talking about the economy and saying things weren't fair and weren't working properly, uh, that was through his work with us as part of the Commission. So I'm going to first run through some of the slides on the data of just how is the economy doing, then take you through the arguments of the report and then talk through some of the policy recommendations that we make and then hopefully there'll be a bit of time for questions at the end. So the first chart, uh, the economy really isn't working. So what's really interesting about this uh, chart is that you see that for the first time in recorded history, we've seen average weekly earnings for decouple from GDP growth. So what that means is that as the economy is growing, most people aren't any better off. And that actually hasn't been true in the past. So historically, if you look at the trend from the 70s through to uh, uh, the late 2000s, what you tend to see is that as the economy grows, uh, weekly earnings also grow. So it used to be simple, right? If you could get the economy to grow, most people would be better off. Actually, in recent years, that's changed. Now, as the economy grows, most people are no better off. Now, as Mariana pointed out, if you look at the labour share of national income, so if you take national income as a whole and say what happens to it, who gets the benefit? Does it go to profits? So does it go to shareholders? Does it returns to capital or does it go to workers? So salaries, wages and so on. What we see is that the labour share, the amount of national income that is going to workers through wages and salaries is in long term decline versus the amount that is going into profits. Um, and so that's part of the reason that you see this issue with weekly wages no longer keeping up with GDP growth is because you've got this long-term decline uh, in the share of national income that goes to uh, labour rather than to capital. What are the other problems in the UK economy? There are so many problems, it's going to take me a little while to get through them all. Um, <laughs> if you look at investment, um, Mariana again touched on this, uh, you actually see that in the UK uh, investment is much lower than other comparable countries. And it's in fact been declining for about 30 years. Um, productivity growth, uh, another new departure point that we've seen since the financial crisis. Uh, productivity growth has basically stalled. It's essentially gone nowhere. And if productivity doesn't improve, it makes it very hard to get wages up. In addition, you can see that the trade deficit in the UK has uh, continued to grow. So the red line on the chart is the trade balance, 
So that's the difference in the trade in goods and the trade in services. So what you see there is in the top, in the blue, um, we have a positive trade balance in services. So we sell more services than we import. Um, Brexit is uh, rapidly taking care of that. Uh, and then the green area of the chart is, is the trade in goods. So we import a lot more goods than we export. And so the net position is negative, and that's the red line there. So basically, we run a trade deficit. We are not paying our way in the world. We are importing more than we are exporting. And in fact, in the last 16 years, the trade deficit has exceeded 2% of GDP. So there's a real issue at the moment in the UK in terms of our overall competitiveness and our position in the world economy. So what's striking about each of those problems that I quickly ran through is that in all cases, those problems stretch back not just a few years, but they stretch back into the 1980s. They stretch back for decades rather than just a few years. So the key messages of the final report of the Commission, and this is the executive summary, you can download it at IPPR.org if you want to read it. This is the short version. You can also download the full book. This version is about 5,000 words and 20 pages. Uh, the book is, is um, 300 pages. You can buy the book online, um, or you can read it online if you like, or you can just read the summary. So the first message is the UK economy is really not working. It's no longer delivering rising living standards for most people. Average earnings have stagnated for a decade, even while economic growth has occurred. People are in insecure work. So for example, uh, in the last 10 years or so, the number of people on zero hours contracts have gone from being uh, less than 200,000 to nearly a million people uh, today. Young people, your generation, are set to be poorer than your parents. Bad news for you. Um, and uh, the nations and regions of the UK are diverging further and further apart. So to take an example, London is the wealthiest region in northwestern Europe. Nine out of ten of the poorest regions in northwestern Europe are found in the UK. So we have the most geographically imbalanced economy in all of Europe. If you take uh, poverty, it used to be believed that work was a reliable route out of poverty, right? You hear the data today. I think the unemployment rate stands at about 4.2%. That's historically um, about as low as it's ever been. In fact, I think unemployment is now at its lowest for, for half a century or so. Um, what those figures disguise, however, is that work is no longer a route out of poverty. 58% of the households that are living in poverty today are working households, households where people are in work. So work is no longer a reliable route uh, out of poverty. Five million people in the labour market today are working below the skill level that they have already attained. So we're not making very much, very good use of people's uh, talents. And the latest research from the University of Manchester suggests that in fact, in some areas of work, it is so stressful and so difficult and so insecure and precarious that for the first time, you're better off for your physical and mental health being unemployed than having a low quality job. That hasn't been the case in the past. Um, but we really have reached a, a crisis uh, in work. The argument we make is that given all of that, the response can't be to just tinker at the edges and tweak a little bit and make some little improvements here and there. As Marianne described, this idea of the sticking plaster and you just intervene, intervene when things are going a little bit wrong, that is wholly insufficient for the times that we find ourselves in. So as a result, we argue that you need to have fundamental reform. And that, in fact, fundamental reform is possible now because it's, in fact, happened in the past. There have been a couple of moments in history where we've been confronted by multiple economic crises and we've come up with a new economic settlement. And that's what we argue we need today. So in the 1930s, Wall Street crash and the Great Depression, um, you had the collapse of the uh, classical model um, and it, essentially its replacement by... Uh, the post-war settlement. So you had a period of breakdown in the 1930s into the 40s, and then the post-war settlement was formed um, with this idea of full employment in a free society, right? Aggregate demand management, the insights that were gained from Keynes. That settlement lasted until the 70s. In the 70s, you had multiple crises, again, uh, the oil shock, stagflation, and so on. And in the, in the 1980s, a new economic settlement was formed for the second time. This time, uh, it was pushed by Reagan and by, Reagan and by Thatcher, um, revolved around the ideas of the monetarists, uh, this idea of free markets, uh, neoliberalism as it gets called um, today. Uh, that was introduced into the US and the UK in particular uh, 
in the 1980s. And that settlement really lasted until 2008, when the whole thing um, came crashing down. There was the efficient market hypothesis. Um, the unfortunate thing about that was that the uh, word hypothesis was less emphasized or understood. And I think it was Alan Greenspan, who'd been the governor of the Federal Reserve, who basically said, yeah, it was wrong. It was a hypothesis, and we got the hypothesis uh, wrong. And so in 2008 marks the period, another period of breakdown in the economic settlement. And so for the last 10 years, you've seen that economic settlement breaking down. So the question is, what goes in its place? And our argument is uh, that we need a new way of thinking about the economy, and that's what the report Prosperity and Justice proposes. So the first big argument is that a fairer economy is in fact a stronger economy. So it used to be thought that prosperity and justice were in conflict. You could have one or the other, but you couldn't have both, that you needed inequality to sharpen the incentives and to encourage people to compete. In fact, what the research shows from organizations like the IMF, the World Bank, and many, many other uh, organizations, many academics, is that in fact, more equal countries have stronger and more stable growth paths, and actually they generate more well-being, more welfare uh, for societies as a whole. So actually, the, e the evidence argues that a fairer economy is in fact a stronger economy. The argument that we then make in the Commission is that it's not good enough simply to make things fairer by redistributing at the end. We think that you need to hardwire economic justice into the way that the economy works. So the tax and benefit system can redistribute. That's important. It will always remain important. But to an extent, it's also a measure of failure. The more that you have to redistribute, the more unfair the economy was to begin with. And so we argue that you need to change the relationships within the economy itself particularly the power relationships, in order to get a fairer result to start with. So one big example of that was the chart that you saw um, from Mariana's lecture, where you saw that divergence between labour productivity and wages uh, is partly to do with the decline in the power of trade unions. So one of the big arguments we make in the report is that you need stronger trade unions in order for workers to be able to bargain for their fair share of productivity improvements. So how do you get there? We have a 10-part plan in the report, and we say that you need these five big shifts uh, across the economy. There's not a single silver bullet, um, but actually you need to have some, some fundamental shifts in the economy. So the first is to promote investment-led growth um, and actually move investment towards the productive economy. One of the striking things about the UK is how little bank lending goes into productive businesses and how much goes into housing. The second is to rebalance the economy, so using industrial strategy. Um, and we call for what we describe as new industrialization. I'm going to talk through what that looks like shortly. Uh, we think that you need to give workers more power, so strengthening trade unions, as I mentioned uh, before. But we need managed automa automation, so that you can't have a process of generating these new technologies that improve productivity, throw it out there and sort of hope for the best that in fact you need a managed process to diffuse innovation across the economy, particularly what we call the everyday economy where most people work. That's large employment, low productivity sectors like retail, hospitality, construction and so on. You need an actual plan to diffuse technology across, across the economy. That uh, we need to promote more open markets. So this is an area where uh, the Commission's argument is perhaps more located in on the sort of traditional right of politics, where we're actually very enthusiastic about markets, but we'd like them to be competitive. And we think that one of the big problems that we've seen emerge in recent years is the near monopoly power of dominant companies. There's some really striking research out from the IMF that shows that since 1980, there has been a 40% increase in corporate markups. So over the cost of production, what's the markup you put on to the product that you sell? Now that increase, it's actually 39% um, increase, is a signal of market power. So in theory, in a wholly efficient market, those markups would be eaten away by competition, right? As more competitive the market, someone would come in and say, well, if you're taking this sort of markup, I'll take 20% less, and you compete it away. Um, in reality, what's grown is that it, what's happened is that corporate markups have grown by 40%. And actually, half of that increase, so 20 percentage points of that increase, has come in the last five or six years. And that shows that this problem is getting worse. So we argue very strongly in the Commission for a new approach to competition policy where you actually confront market power 
uh, head on and particularly thinking about some of the uh, new uh, uh, tech uh, players that have grown very, very large indeed and have dominant market shares. Companies like Amazon, Google and Facebook. And then finally, that we need to spread wealth more widely. So income is very unequal in the UK. Um, it's something like, I think, the, the difference in between the, the bottom uh, decile and the top decile in the UK is something like 11-fold. Uh, um, in France and Germany, it's 7-fold. In Denmark and Sweden, it's 5-fold. In the US, it's something like, I think it's 14-fold, um, but it's getting worse. If you then take wealth inequality, the difference in wealth between the bottom decile and the top decile is a sort of 300-fold difference, right? It's radically unequal between the wealthiest and the least wealthy in society. We make the argument that to get this change to happen, you need to address the imbalances of power. So you need a shift in power from corporate management to workers and trade unions, from dominant companies to innovators and entrepreneurs, from short-term finance towards long-term investors, from Whitehall to the nations and regions of the UK, and a more active and purposeful state uh, that actually deliberately sets out to achieve this broader set of goals and is much more ambitious and entrepreneurial just as Mariana describes. Finally, change is urgent that we actually need to get on with it, whether that's because of the climate change uh, challenge or the political instability that in many respects has its roots uh, in the economic problems that we face. Uh, we need to get moving uh, in addressing these challenges. So the report sets out a 10-part plan uh, to do just that. Um, and it has actually 73 specific policy recommendations. I'm going to canter through some of the sort of highlights, but you'll understand that I won't take you through 73 recommendations in the, I think, 20 minutes or so that I've got, I've got left. So that gives about two minutes per, per part of the plan, and that leaves a bit of time for questions. So the first thing, reshape the economy through industrial strategy. We argue that um, if you take that problem that we have of a massively geographically imbalanced economy, how do you solve that? Well, we want to build high-tech clusters, a process of new industrialization based around the UK's universities. So whilst the UK in general is very spatially imbalanced and unequal, one of the um, more positive aspects is actually there are good world-class universities spread across the whole country. And that actually is quite different from many other countries. It's a unique uh, benefit and attribute of the UK, and it's something that we can build upon. And so we want to build these high-tech clusters built around uh, our, our research-based universities in particular. In order to support that to happen, we propose a national investment bank capitalised to 20 billion, so that can provide equity financing for innovation. So if you take Mariana's example of the valley of death, who can step in? Well, the national investment bank could step in to close that gap. We're very sceptical of tax credits like uh, the R&D tax credit or the patent box. That's because, in fact, our research IPPR shows that about 80% of that is a deadweight loss. So the Exchequer is currently wasting about a billion pounds in tax breaks to big companies, <coughs> particularly to pharmaceutical companies. Uh, we think it's much better spent to take the money, don't put it there, and put it through uh, the state. So Innovate UK would be an organisation that could spend that money, and the National Investment Bank would spend that money much more effectively by providing direct support to businesses rather than tax breaks, uh, uh, particularly to uh, large pharmaceutical companies. Then we propose something called Productivity UK to spread innovation into that everyday economy I described before, that process of managed automation, both to make sure that technology is spread, but also to make sure that the gains are fairly shared uh, with workers. Second set of recommendations are around Good pay, good jobs, and good lives. The first thing is we just think you need to put pay up. Right? There are many complicated ways that you can get to getting wages to go up, but one of the ways that you can do that is actually just to pay people more. If you want to get wages up, pay people more. It's quite a simple solution. Push the minimum wage up. So it used to be believed that what you had to do was that you had to um, earn the productivity improvement, and if you got productivity up, then pay would follow. It turns out that that was basically a big lie. Um, and that if you take the more Scandinavian approach, what do they do in Scandinavia? They actually said, no, no, we're not going to do that. What we'll do is we'll push pay up, and if we push pay up, then the productivity will follow. And in the Commission, we're making that big bet. We're saying, actually, forget this, trying to get productivity up and then trying to get pay to follow. Push pay up, and it will force firms 
uh, to improve their productivity so that they can afford to meet that higher wage bill. Now, there will certainly be some firms that can never get their productivity up to a sufficient degree to be able to afford that. But actually, do we want those firms to exist? Do we want firms that can't afford to pay people a decent wage? What's the point of them? Why, why would we want to keep them? In fact, one of the striking things that's happened in the last 10 years is that the rate of business destruction in the UK has gone right down. And there's actually quite a strong argument um, that we're now enabling far too many low productivity, poor quality, poorly managed, poorly led firms to exist uh, precisely because we haven't put the pressure on them to increase uh, wages. For the zero hours contracts issue, um, a big part of that is, is simply companies transferring risk onto employees. So rather than taking on the employment risk and saying, well, I've employed these people, I better find enough work to do, they shove the risk onto the employee by saying, you've got a zero hours contract and I'll pay you when I have enough work. We argue that if that is the case, that's fine if you want to do that, but we need to erode um, the cost advantage that companies have by shifting risk onto workers by increasing the minimum wage for uncontracted hours uh, up by 20%. So at the moment, if you move to a zero hours contract and you say, well, you're a contractor to me, not an employee, you don't pay nas employers' national insurance contributions in particular. And so by putting the minimum wage up by 20% for uncontracted hours, you actually destroy the incentive to push employees out of employment and into uncontracted hours. It also means that you can retain that flexibility, right? So for some uh, industries, they need that flexibility, and that's fine, but workers should be compensated if they're going to shoulder the risk of that flexibility. We're very enthusiastic about strengthening the role of trade unions um, in the economy, and so we argue to increase collective bargaining, um, and also for auto-enrolment into trade unions and the gig economy. So one of the really striking things is that you hear lots of complaints about the way that uh, technological developments have disadvantaged workers, and that's absolutely true. Um, Firms have used tech in order to atomize labor. But actually, we argue that you could use exactly the same technology in order to collectivize labor and make labor stronger um, by having auto-enrollment into trade unions. You have auto-enrollment into pensions. If you can do it for pensions, we think you can probably do it for trade unions too. Other areas that we tackle, things like uh, pay gaps, so gender and ethnicity, um, parenting leave, more bank holidays. I'm um, trying to think about life much more holistically than just saying it's just about wages. Um, and, and, and so there's a, a sort of variety of recommendations there. You heard a bit about corporate governance. Our first point is that if you want companies to be focused on the long term, the first thing that you have to do is to make it their duty to focus on the long term. And so we propose reforming the Companies Act uh, to make it the duty of company directors to focus on the long term success of the company. We think that voting rights should only be give, given to those who are in it for the long term, so those uh, shareholders uh, who plan to uh, hold a, a company stock for at least a year. Uh, we think that there's been far too relaxed approach to takeovers of UK companies. The amount of corporate takeovers from abroad in the UK economy far exceeds that of any other comparable advanced economy, and we think part of the issue with that is that there has been no public interest test uh, applied to corporate takeovers. And we think that test needs to include employment, uh, regional inequality, but also innovation. You know, one of the things that I think is probably really rather bad for the UK economy was the sale of ARM to SoftBank. Um, and if you take the long-term success of the UK economy, losing a, a, a sort of last major British-owned uh, uh, tech player, I think in the long run, probably will uh, be a disservice to the UK economy. Uh, we also think that you need to get workers more involved in corporate governance. So we argue for two workers to be elected onto the board, so not by the trade unions, but by a vote amongst the workforce, um, that the remuneration committees who set CEO pay, I don't know if you noticed on that chart before that Mariana showed, uh, people who are being, the CEOs who are being paid, you know, not tens of millions of dollars, but hundreds of millions of dollars. We think having workers in the room on the remuneration committees would make quite a big difference to that conversation, especially if the remit is, well, how much do we pay our workers as well as how much do we pay our CEO? Um, and finally, um, it's a kind of a bit of a shocking thing in a way, but there is no body in the UK at the moment that is tasked with overseeing how companies behave. So it's not that surprising when you see these abusive practices by businesses, because in fact, for most businesses, there's no body that's there to make sure that businesses comply to 
uh, corporate governance rules and actually behave responsibly. So we proposed the creation of a companies commission to oversee them. On markets, as Mariana says, these are outcomes. They're not celestial. Uh, they didn't come down from the mountaintop. They aren't uh, things that are given to us um, by God or anyone else. Um, they're human creations. And because of that, we can change the rules about how they operate. Uh, so we think for the first example, I'll go into lots more boring detail on this, um, but getting the, consumer, the, the Competition and Markets Authority to think about market power in and of itself, not just um, to focus on uh, prices. So at the moment, the way that the C Competition and Markets Authority works is it says uh, you can find everything out through prices, consumer welfare. If prices are low, markets are fine, and we don't really have a view on what the structure is, what the conduct is. As long as prices are low, we assume that the market is competitive. Um, our argument is that actually that way of thinking doesn't really work for the new economy. If you take a company like Google, many of its products and services are free, whether it's internet search or using maps. And actually having a basis of just, just looking at consumer welfare and price signals isn't a reliable basis on which to conduct uh, economic policy or market policy uh, for the future. We actually propose an office of digital platforms. So you have the office for water regulation, off what, you have Ofcom, the office for communications and so on. We want off digi, the office for digital platforms to regulate the tech giants, whether that's a duty of care about what they publish on things like Facebook or on Twitter, um, through to the way that they price. So in the US presidential election, for example, uh, Facebook in 2016 was applying a much higher price point to uh, political adverts from the Clinton campaign and from the Democrats than it was to uh, uh, political adverts from uh, Trump and the Republicans, right? Really striking. So one of the arguments we make is actually that if you have market power like that, you shouldn't be able to discriminate on price. Amazon both controls the marketplace and it sells its products within it. So what Amazon does is it tracks what's going on in the market. It finds a product that's very successful. It watches it shoot up the rankings. It sends that same product to its own production facilities, copies it, launches its own version online, and then suppresses the original innovator's product in the search results. So you end up buying Amazon's products. Now, I think that's pretty unfair. If you think about a market that you would go to in a think of a market town, right? You go to a market town and you walk there. Imagine that you had someone who controlled whether you could enter that market or not. Imagine then they sent someone round you know, with a clipboard writing down everything that you bought. And then they said, well, actually, I'm going to control who has what stool and what products get sold in each of the stools. We think that was absurd, an absurd degree of power. Um, but that's the power that Amazon has today. And so we need to have some restrictions on the way that Amazon behaves in that market. Personally, I think that we should ban vertical integration. I don't think that Amazon should be able to sell its own products and have its own platform. I think we should break Amazon up. If it wants to have a products division, that needs to be a separate company uh, from the platform. If you control the market, you shouldn't be a participant in that same market, is, our, is, is, is my particular view. Um, as you can see, we cover a lot. So <laughs> I'm trying to go at a bit of a pace. So a quick canter through, through some of the rest. Macroeconomics, increasing public investment, new fiscal rules, rethinking the role of the Monetary Policy Committee, and coming up with an alternative to quantitative easing in case of a recession. Strengthening the financial system. So uh, here's a question for you to think about. Um, I guess most people in the room know that the Bank of England has a inflation target, right? The target of 2% inflation in prices. Right? And it alters interest rates to try and achieve that 2% target. Should it have a 2% target for house prices or a 0% uh, target for house prices? Question worth thinking about. Other measures, these are all relatively technical, but nonetheless important. More transparency on uh, who controls companies and who controls trusts. And all of these are aimed at strengthening the financial system. Spreading wealth and ownership. So this might be an idea that has some appeal to this particular audience. So our first idea on the list is a citizen's wealth fund that we think could be capitalized over a period of about 10 years from various different sources. Um, and we think that you could capitalize it to a degree where you could offer every single 25-year-old a universal inheritance of 10,000 pounds. Now, we think that's an important step in trying to close that gap in terms of wealth inequality. We think that most people can be trusted to make good decisions. If they got that 10,000 pound, 
inheritance. I think a lot of people might put it towards a deposit on their first home. They might use it to study. They might use it to travel. They might use it um, to put it into a pension. All sorts of different uses. Yeah, it's true. Some people might use it to watch Jeremy Kyle and sit back and eat pizza for a year. That's perfectly possible. Some people might go to Thailand for a year. You've got to accept that in a free society, people will do things differently. But if you trust people and you believe that they have good intentions for their own lives, then actually trusting them with a universal inheritance seems like rather a good idea. There's then a variety of other proposals that we have there to fix the housing market. Um, so for example, at the moment, uh, if, if a, a local authority rezones an area and says this can be used for residential uh, homes or for businesses rather than for, let's say, agriculture, the landowner gets a huge benefit. In other countries, the way that they finance social housing is that the state captures that benefit in the increase in the value of the land and it uses that to finance new housing. We think we should do the same here. It's no different to what's done in uh, Germany or indeed in Singapore. Um, we think there needs to be much more support and expansion for mutuals and cooperatives so that more people have a stake uh, in the companies in which they work. Simpler and fairer taxes. So the first thing is to just simplify it. It is kind of, when you think about it, it's a bit mad that we use these tax bands rather than just having a smooth and simple curve uh, for taxes. So at the moment, if you look at the tax curve, it kind of goes up in steps to be sort of roughly progressive. We point out that if you use the formula, and you just had a smooth curve, you could reduce the top marginal rate of tax from 60% to 50%, and you could also give 75% of people a tax cut. Um, so if you top the curve out at 50%, right, so at the moment it goes up to 60 and then it goes down to 45. If you then did it differently and just had it top out flat at 50 and a smooth curve before, you could give 75% of people a tax cut. We think all income should be taxed the same, that it is madness to say that people who go to work should be taxed more highly than those who happen to get a capital gain from either buying a house or from buying shares. We think that's fundamentally unfair, that we should tax wealth and income from wealth and income from work on exactly the same basis. We also think we should abolish inheritance tax and replace it with a lifetime gift tax. At the moment, inheritance tax is levied on the estate. We think that you shouldn't levy the tax on the estate, you should levy the tax on the recipient. That would also get around the problem that we have today, which is that many people avoid it. If you hand over, if your parents hand over uh, their wealth to their children seven years before their death, they don't pay any tax at all. Under this system, you capture all that and you get an additional nine billion pounds a year. Uh, and then finally, on corporation tax, two big interventions. One, we just think it's too low. It's currently at 19% and it's set to be reduced to 17%. We think we should match the lowest rate in the G7, which is Japan at 24%. Uh, and we also think that there are too many companies that are avoiding it. So it is really striking. If you look at companies like Amazon and Google, uh, you'll have seen who have been avoiding their paying their taxes. Uh, we propose an alternative minimum corporation tax uh, that is based on UK revenues and the global profit margin. And you say, well, okay, if your global profit, let's take Facebook as a real practical example, right? Facebook claims that it has a global margin of 50%, profit margin 50%, but in the UK, somehow magically, um, it only has a profit margin of 5%. Isn't that extraordinary? So globally 50%, but somehow the UK market is so cost to, costly to serve that it has a margin of 5%. Of course, it's total nonsense. In fact, all Facebook is doing is it's managing down its UK profits in order to pay a much lower rate of tax than it should. In fact, it should be paying over 100 million in tax and it pays uh, something like 14 or 15 uh, million. So there are ways that you can get around that by saying, okay, well, if you're gonna report 50% profit margin globally, then we're gonna assume that you're making the same rate of profits in the UK. If you can prove to us, we'll put the burden onto you that somehow the UK market is uniquely unprofitable, then if you want to prove that, sure, we'll, we'll accept that. But unless you can prove it, we're going to assume that you make just as much money in this country as you make in other countries and tax you on that basis. Two final things in terms of the recommendations. These are sort of two foundational areas. One, a Sustainable Economy Act. So at the moment, you have uh, things like the Climate Change Act, which set carbon budgets. We think that you need to have a Sustainable Economy Act that covers all kinds of environmental limits and say so there is a limit to what can be done uh, in terms of the uh, in environmental impacts, supported by a green industrial strategy and a just transition. 
And then secondly, an economic constitution. So moving more power and decision making outside of London and into the nation's regions. Um, and then a variety of different uh, other measures to reduce regional inequality. So it sounds like a pretty radical plan, I hope, when you heard all of that, that these are not small measures. Um, what's really striking uh, is that when we did the polling on all of this, uh, the public um, really like it. And in fact, there isn't a single proposal that gets less than 50% support overall. And if you look on the chart, the green and the yellow lines represent leavers and remainers. So green is remain and, uh, <coughs> and yellow is, is leave. Um, and it's just quite striking as you go through uh, the different uh, policy proposals, how popular they are across the political divide. So it's true, politics feels really divided at the moment, but a programme of fundamental economic reform is precisely the kind of programme that could help bring back together a divided uh, country. So just looking at some of that, it gives us some cause for hope um, that when you put big, bold economic reform ideas to the public, they seem to think it's rather a good idea. Uh, we launched the report um, in September um, at a big event in central London. That's some of the commissioners there on the stage. Uh, lots of coverage. It was covered in the, in the New York Times, in the Financial Times, Telegraph, Guardian, all over the place. Um, Wellby Wealth Tax Storm was the front page of the Daily Mail. Uh, but they devoted half a dozen pages um, to... Uh, uh, to the report's recommendations. Uh, the Economist, FT, and the New York Times all had very nice things to say about it. Uh, lots of people across politics. You know something fundamental is on, on, uh, on the horizon when you get all different political parties and people you wouldn't really expect to agree with each other, agreeing with each other. And I have to say, I think one of the weirdest moments of my professional life was um, the day after the Commission's report when we looked in the papers and there was an editorial from Nick Timothy, who'd been Theresa May's chief of staff, saying ministers should adopt all of the commission's proposals, and an editorial from John McDonnell, uh, Labour's shadow chancellor, saying uh, that a future Labour government would adopt the proposals. And it's just quite striking that actually there is a consensus that we need much more radical and fundamental change in the future than has happened in the past. You also see that it gets support from the Liberal Democrats and from the SNP too. Uh, lots of economists had nice things to say about it. Um, we didn't even pay them to say those things. Um, uh, and journalists that you wouldn't really expect to agree all seem to agree. So Paul Mason, part of the radical left, writes for the New Statesman, very pro-Corbyn, uh, is praising it, there you see. And then you've got Lionel Barber, uh, the editor of the FT, praising it at the same time. Owen Jones from The Guardian, not usually somebody that you would consider uh, likely to be in agreement with Peter Oborn, the associate editor of the Daily Mail, also praising it. So a sort of new political consensus. And then by the party conferences, uh, you had uh, a series of leading politicians essentially adopting its analysis and saying, this is the kind of thing that you, we need to be thinking about and the direction we need to be going. Then, of course, everyone lost their minds about Brexit, and that's where we are right now. <laughs> so I think that's it. Thank you.